this talk, I will argue that interdisciplinary space media uh, investigations by civil society can and must reveal new evidence of both state violence and how civil society survives in the face of it. Uh, so this talk will have two parts. The first, I'll talk about the architecture, what I call the architecture of violence. And I'm going to be speaking about the work of forensic architecture, which is um, an agency based in London that uses spatial and media analysis to investigate human rights violations by state and corporate actors. The second part, which I'll call the architecture of survival, covers my own research on how people respond and survive in the face of that conflict. So forensics typically is a tool of the state to investigate its citizens, but as a civilian agency, forensic architecture is a counter forensic practice that uses degraded tools to reverse the lens back onto the state to investigate their crimes. Forensic architecture largely relies on open source data to reconstruct the space and time of these violations. We rely on this media because they often occur in places we cannot access in war zones or scenes of crime. Um, or require piecing together a past event. Uh, in this example uh, of the 2014 Israeli bombing of Gaza, we had to gather hundreds of pieces of footage posted online and synchronize them uh, in space and time. We often must locate this footage in the site of the investigation, and we do this by looking for clues in the image in relation to the satellite uh, imagery available to us and understand their proportionality and we can use this kind of cross-referencing to understand exactly where someone is. So for us, the built environment is a sensor to events. We can study the architecture itself for traces of, of the event, and it's a medium to understand footage in relation to each other. It's, so in le otherwise, it'll all be isolation, uh, isolated images. Now we can understand them in relation to the time of other images. Um, our investigations range in scale from um, a single incident of killing to widespread war crimes to environmental destruction. So I'm going to be talking about three cases, the first two a bit more in depth. The first case concerns a building strike in Syria. So in March, 2016, in March 2017, uh, we saw online reports that a mosque was bombed in Syria by the U.S., but the U.S. denied that. Um, U.S. Central Command did claim responsibility for the strike, but it insisted that it did not target the building that we see on the left-hand side, what they call the mosque at the left edge of the photo, and that the area was extensively surveilled. So we had a, a simple task that was architectural. The question for us was, what was the use of the building? Uh, were there civilian casualties? And how did the incident unfold in space and time? So we used available and sourced imagery, videos, satellite photographs, survivor testimony to begin to analyze the building before and after the strike. First, we identified two large craters in the north part of the building and munitions experts confirmed to us they're likely two 500 pound bombs meant to destroy the building. Uh, we then obtained a, build, a video of the building recorded two months before its destruction and we use this video to begin to look for architectural clues of what it was used for. So the first thing we'll notice is that there's a speaker on the top, which is used for the event, the call to prayer. Uh, the next thing we saw is that there was a sign next to the entrance that reads, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab Mosque. We asked a local photographer to document the site, uh, so we're sure, and we see the sign still there. And we also asked them to go inside to what remained of the building, and to begin to document the architecture within, first we see shoe racks, which are consistent with um, worshippers taking off their shoes before entering a prayer hall. And the evidence just becomes more clear because then we see a mihrab where an imam leads the prayer. Um, we also see rugs for a prayer as well. We also uh, spoke with the building's original contractor, who was himself wounded in the strike, to begin to piece together the architecture that that was in the building beforehand, um, to understand the use and the spaces within it. So we can reconstruct it very exactly. And we use these architectural drawings back and forth as a means of communication. We also spoke to the first responders who located where they pulled people from the rubble, and we matched that to the building's floor plans. 
after we launched this investigation, um, the Pentagon conducted their own investigation and concluded that the building had been indeed used as a mosque. The second case I want to talk about is in the context of the battle against the terror group Boko Haram. Amnesty International reported, however, in this battle that Cameroon's elite forces were illegally detaining, without evidence, people suspected of relating to the group and torturing them sometimes to death. And so Amnesty International asked us to investigate two of many sites of illegal torture and detention. Salak, one of the sites we investigated, is the headquarters of the Special Forces Operation Against the, the Terror Group and the site of detention and torture. And we can see in the recent years that the base has substantially grown. So we built a model of this base through interviews and prisoner drawings and images, and they helped us locate where they were tortured and detained. This is just one of those rooms that they drew and many people drew. And so we found consistency uh, in what was in it and what they did to them there. So we began to visualize their horrific experience. They also pointed to other locations of torture and detailed the conditions inside the small cells they were held. The satellite image confirms their, the place and the size of these cells, but we don't know what they are inside. So the testimony kind of fills that void. By them telling us how many people were inside and what kind of conditions existed, we can begin to understand what it may have been like inside some of these cells. And they did confirm that, um, that this was quite accurate to what they experienced. Inside the cells, there were small holes, and this is kind of another, this is where this investigation took another turn. And they, the holes were for breathing, of course, but they also used the holes to look outside and look what's around them. And when they looked outside, they said they saw torture, but they also said they saw foreign personnel. <clears throat> foreign personnel that they saw and thought uh, were American. And they said that they could see them and they could see us. That's that, that was what they described. They said they saw them in the front of the cell and in the back of the cell, running around and exercising. So we found photos uh, of this, and but first we wanted to investigate this claim a bit more. And we found military contracts actually that confirm a presence in Salak. But this is the first time it was ever reported by us. Uh, and so it, it was the first time there was established a presence there. We also found photos posted on social media by U.S. personnel themselves uh, with Cameroonian officers and U.S. personnel. And we were able to locate each one of these throughout the base. This helps us understand where they were in the base. And we found that these photos actually existed throughout the entire base. For example, here is the helicopter pad, which was one of those expansions. And here at the entrance of the base, the same person posted another photo. Alongside the buildings, also the trees and the satellite image also help us place sometimes um, where the images lie. And here we see U.S. personnel training these soldiers, the very soldiers that may be accused of these crimes. And in an almost comical video, we see U.S. personnel and the BIR, the, the Special Forces units, playing football with night vision equipment. So we cross-referenced uh, <laughs> all of this image the locations of the U.S. personnel where they were seen, the location of the U.S. social media posts, uh, and the location of detention sites, and the location of torture. So this shows us that senior command likely knew and that it was visible and accessible to U.S. personnel. As well, after we launched this investigation with Amnesty, the U.S. announced an investigation into torture at Salak. The third case is a different scale of data. This is based on a large aggregate. And this was based on us creating a platform that uh, we designed called Time Map, which we've used for multiple investigations. <clears throat> now, following the killing of George Floyd, protests against police brutality were themselves faced with violence. So we collected footage and we looked at the elements of the city and placed them within the country throughout many states. Uh, and we worked with a Bellingcat on this, uh, which is a open source investigatory journalism group. So the platform allows us to categorize the data of incidents, such as when police use tear gas or pepper spray or so-called less lethal rounds. 
and you can either, either see where all the incidents are or you, we can see and isolate them according to the categories of the, the types of the incidents. It also helps us understand the patterns of abuse, such as the abuse of medics and attacks against journalists as well. Break down the incidents by type so we can see them simultaneously and down to the level of the city. Now in the second project, the second part of this lecture, I'm going to be introducing and building on the concepts that I just introduced to you. Uh, this is my own research project about what I call civilian architectural responses. The architecture civilians create and change to survive in the violence of war. So think of it as an expansion of what I showed you. While forensic architecture is about seeking evidence of violations through media and space, this project is about finding evidence of survival. What do people do in response to this violence? So my research is currently on Aleppo, uh, a city which has been ravaged by the war, um, the Syrian civil war in recent years. And the front of civil space, um, this, the civil space was basically divided entirely and constantly, and it ripped through neighborhoods entirely. So, but civilians were not just passive victims. Uh, they were active participants in shaping the city. They're not just waiting around. They had to survive. So they built new structures, changed existing ones, and created new networks. Here we see a boy, for example, mixing cement in an olive oil can, collecting rubble, and piecing it together like a puzzle around Along the rest of the street, we see that others have done so, just to create their own shelters where glass stores maybe once were. So this is the civilian architectural response, one example of it. People taking agency over their spaces and directly intervening. Now, these aren't new, but Aleppo and other conflict cities today, like in the work of forensic architecture, allows us to see these things for the first time. Because these kinds of interventions are the first to go. They're very temporary. It also makes up an enormous amount of data, which is ironically too much data. Like we don't know how do we find specific architectural interventions when there's like a sea of every incident. So I had to develop a, a kind of intuitive method to find this architecture. I kind of think of it as a manual algorithm, very uh, simple. Uh, but I first organized the research according to the neighborhoods. I looked at where damage was because that's likely where people intervened more. And then I referred to this platform also uh, by researchers at Columbia University that spatializes YouTube, three YouTube channels, prominent YouTube channels, to understand the density of media, where people are filming more. So together, I just created, this is not a calculation, but just used it to, to create an intuitive ranking of where to begin, where to begin to look. For each neighborhood, I used web scraping, uh, which extracts data from pages and puts it in a spreadsheet for me, at, le at least. Um, and I mostly scraped YouTube using the software um, called Scrapebox uh, with the keywords of the neighborhood. It would return a sheet like this with the date, time, and uh, location um, sometimes mentioned in the title. And the date was very important for me because it correlates to the events of the conflict. So I'm going to show you three examples of what I found uh, quickly. Uh, the first is to do a civil space, the buildings where people lived and depended uh, for services. And this one concerns a hospital. So as I'm looking through this list, this is like me manually watching videos to see if I can see any clues of interventions. I would go through the list and scan each video for suspected responses. Uh, if I find anything, I would go find as much material as I can on the same building. Uh, in this instance, it's a hospital, like I said. This was actually the subject of an investigation by forensic architecture. And through it, we also I also saw um, this intervention that they built a secondary wall outside of the hospital. They built this wall out of reinforced concrete and the cinder blocks in between. And between the cinder blocks, they included this piping that allowed the blast wave of, of, of bombs to pass through them while still protecting the building from shrapnel. I located this footage in space and used it to build a 3D model and drawing to document, to understand the, the extents and the typing uh, of this construction and its material makeup. How did they build it? We see in images soon after the, the, the battle ended that the building was the first to be renewed, was one of the first to be renewed. This is kind of evidence of like how ephemeral it is how quickly it disappears. The second uh, example relates to movement. So at the, at the outbreak of the battle, uh, all movement was halted and the front lines where there was territory meeting 
together is basically a no man's land and it's always moving and shifting. So your house could all of a sudden be on the front line of a battle. And so people have to find ways to, to cope with that because uh, they had to also continue some sort of movement. So in some cases, they might have tried to block the barrier of snipers, which were very prevalent. Uh, but in other cases, they had to directly intervene in their own homes to create alternative paths of movement altogether. In this video from 2013, the way it was called the way to get from Al Jalloum neighborhood to Al Kalasi neighborhood, we see this first kind of intervention. The videographer says, here's Al Kalasi street. He points to it. He explains that the street leads to Jamal Mosque, but they cannot go there because there's a sniper on the street. So how do we get to Jamal Mosque? He asks. We can go this way, no problem, another person says. So now he's going to turn and we're going to see this entrance to an old house. Here they're sitting in old Aleppo, which is made up of centuries old courtyard houses. And we see people are walking casually in and out of this house, uh, which is a very strange scene. And as we enter, we're going to see it, uh, that the building is more and more uh, damaged and clearly abandoned. But we quickly see the place of intervention, a hole in the stone wall separating two houses that people are passing through, a centuries old stone wall, I might say, uh, which leads to an exit in the back that leads to the mosque they were talking about. So I had to look at each of these frames and understand kind of their movement. I just quickly sketched where they were moving and, and, and walking and was able to locate it in a satellite image uh, where they passed through. Uh, I drew a plan of this to understand it, its um, space and also re documented it in three dimensions along with the detail of the intervention. The last, which I'll just quickly go over, is the violence of infrastructure, uh, which is that water was used as a weapon of war, the Red Cross had declared. And together with civil society, this isn't exclusively a civil civilian project, but um, I think it still qualifies as, as, a, as a response by civil society. Um, they built this alternative network of water by rehabilitating old wells because water tanks and um, uh, pumping stations were being targeted in, during the war. And people, two million people were left without water at some point. So they created this alternative network and created a GPS map for people to find. Uh, and so they would place them in uh, clear urban centers, such as this, uh, another mosque that was um, rehabilitated and it's already an urban center. So people already know where to go uh, and clearly marked with this, with this red color. So in this temporary temporality, uh, they decentralized the infrastructure that was highly centralized before and, and briefly democratized the, the infrastructure of the city. Um, by allowing the distribution of the water. We can just begin to see these layers of these fronts and counter fronts of basically uh, the fighters using the city as a weapon and civilians resisting also through the city. Uh, so in the city, in Aleppo, for an alone movement was stopped and people rerouted it, civil space was targeted and people mended it, um, infrastructure was cut and people rehabilitated it. And the front lines were always fluid and changing and destruction scarred the city. So together, these things only leave us a partial idea, as complex as it is, of what's going on in a, in a city uh, ravaged by war. But it helps us understand um, the intervention of architecture by people at the level of the city and down to the human level. And we can extend this approach I want to emphasize to cities globally. And my hope for a project like this is to develop um, an understanding between a global conflicts by people sharing and understanding and aggregating all the techniques people have used to survive so that we can learn from each other. That war, civil society and conflict shouldn't be in isolation. So we can begin to document this uh, and at the very least um, document their struggle, document their uh, survival to remember these people uh, within this architecture. Thank you.